Today we begin a new series entitled 21 Days of Prayer, and before we even begin this series, I just want to be up front with a couple of things. One, this series is not a series about prayer. This is not about prayer as much as it is a series about praying. So we're launching this series because there's actually something specific that I believe that we as a church need to be praying together about Second thing is this, too, if you are someone who is new or someone who doesn't really know whether you believe everything you've heard about Jesus or the Bible or um, prayer, uh, you're going to hear me say things like this throughout this series. We need to do this. Uh, You need to do this. And I want you to know, first of all, you're off the hook. You don't have to do anything I suggest. That's because much of this series is geared towards the people who call clarity their community of faith. Now, while much of what we talk about may not be specifically geared to a person who is like that, I know that there's always something for you, for all of us, whenever the scripture is read. So today we'll be looking at a historical account, a historical account of the early church, and I hope what we learn about the early church helps us find more clarity on who Christ is. In fact, I want to go ahead and invite you all to open up with me to the uh, book of Acts. It's a part of the scripture that records the early history of the church. We're going to be in chapter 4 today, starting in verse 12. Starting in verse 12. Now, while you turn there, um, when I look back at this past year or 18 months, many of us had no choice in having our everyday rhythms repurposed and reoriented, did we? We all, during these past 18 months, found ourselves at some point in this season of life, living life differently. According to one research, about 20% of Americans work from home prior to COVID. Let's just do a little test of our own. How many of you work from home prior to COVID? We got two hands in the back, one hand. Okay. By October 2020, that number rose to 71%. In October 2020, how many of you work from home? Okay, so there was an increase here, right? I know in this fellowship we got a lot of first responders and essential workers, so you didn't have a choice. Fast forward to today, how many of you are still working from home? Yeah, a lot of those same people. And this shift has really translated into a stark reality that many people who worked from home over COVID experience, that they will probably never, ever go back to an office again. For many people, that is a reality. There's also a reality that many K-12 teachers uh, never thought would be embraced so soon, which was the education of elementary and middle school students online, right? If you, if, if you were to ask a K-12 through teacher, uh, the average K-12 teacher, obviously there's outliers and whatever, uh, that, you know, can, can we effectively educate kids K-12 through online? Like, no, <laughs> but we didn't have a choice because kids needed to be educated, and so during COVID, what did they do? They taught kids online. And now for many people I know who uh, embrace that reality, I have friends of mine who now, their job has transitioned from classroom teaching to now they are actually teaching, guess what? Online as part of the vocation, as a K-12 through teacher. So life, life for work, work life has definitely been reoriented. When the restaurants closed and the gyms closed, remember that? Josh remembers when the gyms closed. Many of us were forced to reorient the rhythms of our life, right? As one journalist wrote, cooking one of life's most basic chores has suddenly become a creative outlet and source of comfort for a whole new audience of the housebound. I know, you know, if you're on social media, if you're not, don't worry, it's, it's no shame, but like if you're on social media, like it seemed like everybody was learning how to cook sourdough bread, right? <laughs> like, or everyone was trying to become like a chef and everyone was trying to figure out how to do things. And when the restaurants closed, we all had to repurpose our rhythms. We couldn't, if we were used to going out on dates and eating out, and the couples, they were learning how to cook together in the home, right? So we repurposed our rhythms and it was reoriented. I have a neighbor who is a fitness freak, actually more than Josh, believe it, and he was forced to repurpose his garage and transformed it into a gym complete with like squat 
and dumbbell racks and exercise bike. He even has, he, he, had, he, he went and bought like the, not just the interlocking kind of flooring, like the legit flooring that you would see in a karate studio. Like he went all out. And, <laughs> and he, even, he, even, he even got an exercise bike, a rower, and even has one of those tractor trailers, tires. You know what I'm talking about? Like them, them big tires. Like, so uh, my neighbor, he, he, he learned to repurpose his rhythms. He learned to, to repurpose his garage and reorient his rhythms. Now, these are just a few examples of how our current realities have forced us to reorient and repurpose our everyday rhythms. And for some, like my neighbor, even his everyday environment, his garage, they learn to reorient them, repurpose them so that they can accomplish what's most important to them. What is important for my neighbor? It was working out. He needed to work out, and so he repurposed his garage He took what was set aside previously for storing stuff, and now he repurposed it so he could actually accomplish the things that he wanted to. People have to work. People have to work out. Children need to learn. Fitness junkies need that shot of endorphins when they get working out. I don't know. That's just I'm not a workout person, so I'd imagine that's what a workout person feels. Because I, whenever I go to the gym, I always hear. Is that how it works? I don't know. Fitness junkie? No. He's like, no, that's not how it works. Over the last several weeks, I did my best to help remind those of us who've chosen to submit all of life to Jesus as Master and Savior more and more each day that the purpose of our God sending His Son into the world was for more than just so you and I could be forgiven of our sins and live in the freedom of embracing a life ruled by God's will and way instead of the decisions of our lives being ruled by our sin. God had a bigger plan. And as we talked about last week when we looked at a part of the Apostle Paul's letter to the churches in and around a city called Ephesus, God didn't just send Jesus to be a savior. God sent his son because he was building what? A family. Ephesians 1 verse 5 says this, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. It wasn't a burden. And we sang about that today. I'm a child of God. This is why some of us, we struggle because we're like, does God really want a child like me? Paul says, it gave him great pleasure with all your faults and your failures and your inability to live up to his standards. He sent his son Jesus so you could be part of his family. And by the way, it was not a burden. And there's nothing more valuable to the mission of God to building a family by helping people experience the gospel of Jesus with clarity than people who choose to rearrange their life to reorient their life so that they live life together as family, the family of God that God instituted, that God started, that he paid a great price for so that we could also live together on mission with God. Or as one author said, he says this, regardless of the style or size of your church, your greatest asset to building faith And your community is not your Bible study, worship band, oh, the worship band's nice, facilities or budget. The most valuable resources you have to help people see God are the people in your church who are transformed by God. So as we embark on this 21 days of prayer, my hope is that both people who have been transformed by God and maybe people who desire to be continually transformed by God would engage, and this is the theme of today, but the theme of the next 21 days, would engage in bold prayers. Because what I'm going to dare to ask all of us to pray about at the end of today's message is going to require some boldness. And so today I'm going to make some pretty big asks today, today. So, but before we do that, um, I want to take one of my favorite passages and demonstrate how the early church prayed. And this brings us to our text today in Acts chapter 4. Are you there? 
Acts chapter 4 is very interesting. Uh, For those of you, oh, I almost fell there. Did you see that? Uh, For those of you who have been with us over the past year, remember we started the book of Acts over a year ago once COVID hit. And uh, if if you remember chapter 4, a lot of this will seem kind of like a refresher course, but just to get us all caught up uh, in in, in Acts, uh, if you remember in the beginning of Acts, there was about 3,000 people that came to faith in Jesus. Peter got up, was like, hey, here's the gospel. And they said, we are cut to the heart. What must we do? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. And so about 3,000 church, uh, 3,000 people joined the church in one day, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. And then a few days later, Peter and John are headed to what was the epicenter of Judaism, which was the temple in Acts chapter 3. And Peter and John were walking to the temple uh, next to a gate called Beautiful. Some of you guys remember, remember this? And next to the gate, there was this, what? beside the gate. There was a, a beggar. There was a beggar by the gate, and he, hasn't, he wasn't able to walk, right? He wasn't able to walk since he was born. And the text says that so that uh, everyone who reads this and who understands it, like, oh, one, we know who that guy is. Two, uh, this, this, this is something we all know. Since he was born, it wasn't like he was faking being crippled, okay? So since he was born, and as beggars do, what, is, what do beggars do? They beg. He begs Peter and John for some money. Why? Because he needed to survive. And Peter and John say, we don't have any money, but we have something better than that. And then what they do, they say, pick up your mat and walk. And the guy gets up and follows them into the temple. And the people in the temple recognize this guy because, well, he's been begging outside the temple gates for years. And what happens? They are absolutely blown away. They're like, oh my goodness. And so the word begins to spread fast, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's this mob that begins to surround this guy, most likely, you know, to just kind of have rubbernecks, like when you see an accident at a, at a, at a, on an interstate, except this time, it's a good thing, and so everyone's like, what's going on? Did you hear the, the guy, you know, you know, I don't know, Markel, I'm going to call him Markel, but he has a name, he doesn't have a name. Well, Markel, he was, he was by the gate, he got healed. Yeah, what was that? let's go, let's go. And so this mob begins coming around, and a person who was unable to walk was able to now walk. A miracle had happened. Of course, Peter can't help himself. He sees that he's got a captive audience. And so what does he do? He's like, I remember last time we had a whole bunch of people together. I preached the gospel and people got saved. Let's try that again. And so he launches into the sermon, Acts chapter 3. And by the end of the message, people started to believe. And the number of believers in the church of Jerusalem, in, in church, in, in Jerusalem began to grow. Uh, estimates over 5,000, just the men, in the city of Jerusalem, which meant that possibly 10%, catch this, 10% of the city of Jerusalem had turned their attention to this new belief that Jesus had risen from the dead. And as you would expect, the religious leaders were ticked off, and they were, they were Jewish, and Peter and John were a threat to their message, and so what did they do? They arrested him, and they threw him into prison, and the next day, they're brought before a council of leaders to explain what happened, and Peter said, hey, I'm glad you're asking why I am doing what I'm doing, and then he launches into another sermon, right? You have to read it for yourself, Acts, Acts chapter 3, it's very interesting. And then he concludes his message as he goes into Acts chapter 4, and he says this. Here's what he says. We're, we're picking up in verse 12. So here's what he says. Remember, he's in front of these people that are upset at him for preaching the gospel. What does he say to them? Catch this. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which We must be saved. Who is he talking about? Who's this name? Does anybody know? Jesus. Jesus. If you know anything about Jewish uh, religion, right? Like, what's the only name to be revered? Yahweh, right? This is big news. Like, (laughs) this is like blasphemy. Do you you catch this, right? Uh, Sorry I'm trying to hype it up, but... We're not Jews, and so sometimes it just doesn't hit us (laughs) like it would the the original readers of this. I mean, this is blasphemy. This is crazy. He just got out of jail for saying this stuff, and then he goes and says to this audience, we can't shut up. God's grace and his power and love are so amazing. See, look what happens in verse 13. He goes like this, when they observe the boldness of Peter and John 
and realized they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition. What if the church not only had boldness, but despite our lack of education and lack of the things that the world should think that people should have to be impressive, what, what if the church, because of their boldness, people recognized that we had been with Jesus? Like, do people around you, are they impressed by, your, by you in such a way that they go, man, I know Will. He's an awesome guy. Well, why do you say he's awesome? I don't know, but he's, I just think it's because he's been with Jesus. Like, what if we began to think of our lives' rhythms and the choices we make through the lens of, like, how does this bring glory to Jesus? How does this reflect who Jesus is? And then, what if actually the fruit of our lives of obeying Jesus day after day resulted in, for Peter and John, there was a man who had been healed, and the people who were skeptical and of opposition to him, what did they have to say against him? Well, they had nothing, it says, verse 14, to say in opposition. Why? Because the proof of their obedience to living their faith out resulted an undeniable fact that the Lord was with them. Now, verse 15 says this, after they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves. Allow me to summarize the next few verses. Uh, after conferring among themselves, basically they said, Peter and John, we're going to let you go, but you got to shut up about Jesus, don't talk about the resurrection, and quit blaming us for crucifying Jesus. And then they say this in verse 19, Peter and John answered them. Here's what he, they have to say to, to basically what they were trying to tell them. He says this, Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you decide. <laughs> for we are unable we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them further, they released them. They found no way to punish them because the people were all giving glory to God over what had been done. For this sign of healing had been performed on a man over 40 years old. Verse 23, after they were released, they went to their own people. They went back to their church. Okay, just put it in modern day terms. And they went to their own people and reported everything the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they, the church, heard this, they raised their voices together to God and said, Master, you are the one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Now, let me ask you a question. If you were part of a local fellowship of believers that Peter and John were a part of, how would you pray? Like if, if you found out that, you know, I got thrown in jail or whatever, whatnot, I'm not Peter and John, but, like, but if you were part of, let's, let's take me out of the equation. Let's go to Peter and John. If you, if you were part of the church that Peter and John were part of, how would you pray? You almost lost like the leaders of this movement. They had spent the night in jail and it was a pretty close call. They could have, you know, lost their life. After all, you know, as history would tell us, the opposition to the early disciples was very strong. How would you pray? What would you pray for? I know I'd pray for, I'd, I'd pray for protection. Lord, Lord, protect me. You know, God, Protect me, God bless me, God cover me, God watch out for me, right? And if you're like me, you might have suggested that we come up with a strategy for keeping Peter and John a little safer next time. That would probably be a good idea. But was this how the early church prayed? Are you ready? Listen to how they prayed. Look at this, verse 24. This is so good. 
After they were released, they went to their own people and reported everything to the chief priests and elders and said to them, when they, the church, heard this, they raised their voices together, together to God and said, Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit by the mouth of our father David, your servant, why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers assemble together against the Lord, against his Messiah. For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, (laughs) okay, so pretty much everybody, assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, they're still praying to God here, to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. Now this is not, let me just stop, this is not a a defense for Calvinism, but we have to take the text at its word. Like, wait a minute. It was God's plan that his son would die? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're not really big into Old Testament writings that spoke about the things that would happen to Jesus that comes to earth, what you really need to know about what I just read here was this, that in the next few verses... This church's prayer basically started out like this. God, we know you're sovereign, and nothing happens without your knowledge. Everything that is happening to us, everything that happened to Jesus, whom we love, and everything that is happening to us now, we're not surprised by it. We're not surprised by it. In fact, We believe you have a plan. This is the earlier church, by the way. I'm not, whatever overtones you might think might be alluding to our current realities, let the Holy Spirit say what he needs to say. I'm just talking about what happened here. Now listen to what their prayer request was. Verse 29, this gets really good. Verse 29. And now, Lord, here's the big ask, Consider their threats and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness. Okay, so time out. Boldness? (laughs) Boldness? They're asking for boldness. Isn't what boldness the very thing that got them in trouble in the first place? Isn't boldness is what got Peter and John sent to jail? Isn't boldness is what had them stand before the Sanhedrin? Isn't boldness is what had them put, you know, thrown out of the city? Isn't boldness what got them to this place? Do you know why the message of Jesus made it to 2021? You know why the gospel of Jesus is still as powerful and effective and life-changing as it was then, as it is now, right now? Do you know why? It's because followers of Jesus followed this pattern of the first early church who prayed for boldness, for boldness but they also prayed for something else. Check this out. For you cessationists and conservative Baptist background people, this will make you a little uncomfortable, but we'll just embrace it anyway. It's in the Bible. Here we go. Ready? Verse 30. While you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. So, Lord, consider the threats, grant your servants that he may speak your with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand for healing, signs, and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Now, what's going on here? Phil, where are you going to go with this? Mm-hmm. Hold on to your seats. Ready? <clears throat> this verse gets really overlooked because of the craziness we've seen in, uh, you know, certain kind of church backgrounds. Uh, I grew up in a Pentecostal background, and so I, I get it. I get it. Uh, I get how some people can be skeptical of these. Skeptical. That's a new word I just made up. But skeptical is another word that's in the dictionary that we're going to use right now. 
I get it how people can be skeptical when it comes to signs and wonders, but listen, here's what you need to know. When you take, we consider the context of this verse, the reason they prayed this way was simply because this, it is tied to the mission of God. They wanted their community to know about God, but this is not about signs and wonders. The context of the prayer is this, God do something so powerful that people are pointed to you. That's what this was about. And so what if you and I prayed like this? Like what, what if you, you and I were, 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 were prayed a version of this, maybe in our context? What if we, we prayed this? God, would you stretch out? Would you stretch out your hand and do something through our church in our secular community? with our friends and acquaintances within my circles of influence who are maybe anti-church or who have been burned by religion, would you, would you show up in such a way that it feels miraculous? Like, it would be a miracle. Like, it would be a sign that you are building a family. Would you help us create the kinds of environments where everyone within our circles of influence can experience the life-changing power of the gospel of Jesus with clarity? As we look at the New Testament church and we see the writings and we see the teachings, we know that the context of, uh, of signs and wonders were, were for, for what? The purpose of them were to bring people to who? Jesus. Signs and wonders were never the end. The main goal was that Christ would be glorified, that people would place their trust in Jesus. Jesus. Now, I don't know what would it would take to have that happen in a church like us, but here's what happened in a church like this when they prayed that. Check this out. Verse 31 says this. This is so good. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled, shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. If it wasn't amazing, a miracle of enough that the place shook, that was really Kind of a cool miracle, like, oh, the place shook. The greatest miracle of this verse is the second part. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. And then look what happened at the end of their prayer, verse 32. It says this, now the entire group of those who believe. This is actually the greatest miracle. Like earthquake, cool miracle. Right? Isn't that a cool miracle? Like, what if we prayed right now and all of a sudden, <laughs> that'd be cool. What if we prayed and all of a sudden, every, you just, oh, the gospel, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm gonna, wouldn't that be a cool miracle? Right? Especially if you feel introverted. Like, but here's the greatest miracle, I think, that happened as a result of the prayer. Look at verse 32. Now, the entire group of those who believed, here's a miracle, were of one heart. And mind. And no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. But instead, they held everything in common. Along with this prayer for boldness, there's this outbreak of extreme generosity. This is a miracle. Trust me. There's a, an outbreak of extreme generosity with their resources, their time, their talents, and on and on and on. Why? 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 because they were focused on being a part of God's mission in the world. And so what is God's mission in the world? What is it that the disciples were, we, we, we know that they were telling everyone who came to faith in Jesus. They said, repent and be baptized. And they quickly told them about Jesus' last words to them, which was this. Go, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And make disciples of all nations. We told you to repent and be baptized, but here's what you need to do. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
Okay. That's the preaching part. I got 10 minutes. I hope you are encouraged by this picture of what happened in the early church. Now, I, I want to get to some of you who are students of uh, public speakers or preaching. I, I might not, not have done a good job to segue into this next part, but this next part is really important, and I just want to call out that if I didn't get there smoothly, forgive me, but what I want to say next is very, very important regarding boldness that I'm asking us to have, to ask the Lord in. And basically, if you decide to join us for our 21 days of prayer, you'll find that a major part of what, I'll just be honest, what I'm going to ask of you to have bold prayers about is the intentions to pursue a permanent home for Clarity Church, a launching pad for engaging in the mission of God in the world. In fact, what I want to do right now is, uh, you don't have to do it now, but if you go on the app or just my.clarity.church, you scan the QR code, you'll see a little graphic that says 21 days of prayer, and then you'll see things that says, click here to sign up, and you can either ask for a PDF, you can ask for an email being sent to you every morning if you're like, ah, I'll download the PDF, but then it'll just get stuck on my desktop. So email me every morning. Or if you want to text, you're like, I don't, I get too much email, everything looks like junk, and if I get the PDF, that'll get lost. So send me a text message, even though I know I'll hate it. I'll send you, we'll send you a text message. Every single day, we'll, I'll, I'll just text you the whole thing. Every, so if you want, I'm, I'm really trying to make it as easy for you to engage in this, and we'll do this every morning. But basically, over the recent years, one of the ways we've tried to clarify how we as a church join God and his mission in the world is by saying this. And if you know it, go ahead and repeat after me so, um, so it makes me feel like you've been listening over the past couple years. But uh, we believe that clarity exists so that what strangers can be what? Friends. Friends can be family and family can be missionary servants in the world, that, you know, that you know, family could be servants, really, the idea, servant one another, right? right? There's, there's endless passages in the Pauline epistles about one another. We call them the one another passages, to serve one another. And then missionaries within the rhythms of your everyday life. So we want strangers to become friends, friends to become family, and then family eventually be encouraged to become missionaries and servants, And living like this requires bold prayers for bold living. It requires bold prayers for bold living to say we want to extend friendship to those who are strangers to us. Like if you're introverted, that's a bold prayer. What are you asking me to do? Invite strangers to be friends? Oh no, that takes a lot of boldness. And then it it takes boldness to, to, to have this idea that not only become friends to us, but that our relationship with them could make them friends with the people of God and maybe even become friends of God. And sometimes we refer to people who are strangers to God as those disconnected from God. In other church circles, they might call them unchurched people, but however you like to call them, there are people for whom we, the church, are disconnected with relationally. I just call them strangers. You might call them acquaintances. And for the small percentage of those for whom meeting strangers is a no big deal, right? Like me. Like I see a stranger and I'm like, (laughs) you're mine. Okay, right? So for those of you for meeting strangers is no big deal. Our current realities make forging new friendships with strangers difficult. Like it's difficult. Like I still have that ooh new person. I'm like, oh, wait. So what, like, like COVID, right? Because at the end of the day, you still want to be respectful. And, and is it okay? I'm, I'm, how do you say hi and make someone feel welcome at six foot distance? Like, do you know what I'm saying? Do you, you know what I'm saying? Right? These new realities just kind of really make it hard. They didn't. They didn't let me know at the extroverted school uh, for extroverts how to make friends with people via social distancing, all that kind of stuff. Past that, we have a problem. And I just want to be clear, it's not just a Clarity Church problem. It's not even a church problem. The realities of the world we live in have caused us to make choices that have unintentionally caused friends 
to actually become strangers. Think about it. Think about it. Think about over COVID. With the social distancing and all this, unless you were adamant about Zoom and phone calls, there was just something about the nature of our current realities that caused our, even those we consider our friends to become what? Strangers. I was just talking this week to someone who calls Clarity home and we were reflecting on how weird everything is now. And they made a comment that, um, quite frankly, I'm glad it was over the phone and not like Zoom or anything or in person because I literally cried. They said, you know, Phil, when we came to Clarity, we chose to leave a big church with tons of programs because we couldn't seem to connect in community. In fact, it's, a, it's one of our sister churches, and I'm really good friends with the pastor and, you know, good, healthy church. And this person said, we came to Clarity because it felt like family from the first day we came into a gathering. Now with COVID, we haven't been able to connect with our church family, and it feels like we're strangers again. And so when I think of my church now, it doesn't really feel like family. It just seems like three songs and a sermon. I miss the family part. So can I get really just honest and transparent with you for a second? You know, at the threat of sounding like... Uh, <laughs> Anyone see uh, Steve from Blue's Clues? He put out that new video, like made everybody cry, right? Hey, friend, right? At the threat of sounding like an Asian version of Steve from Blue's Clues, here's what I want to tell you. Um, can we be friends? Can we, can we be friends again? Like, like really? Can we be friends? Because we need to be friends again. Because friends help strangers become friends. So where am I going with this? A year ago, a building seemed like the best thing to help us continue to reach more and more people for Jesus. And trust me, I have not lost that focus. But within our current realities, there is nothing that is on my heart quite as strong as this desire to see our church become friends again. I enjoy the honor of preaching to you like any other preacher, but I would trade these Sundays and these preachings and the, and, and, and the, the fun that I get and studying God's Word and, and trying to make it clear if I could just create environments for us to be friends again so we could become family again. And so as I look at this idea of a building, I, I just think a, a building could be a tool to help facilitate that. And whether you realize it or not, <laughs> we're already investing resources in buildings. Like, <laughs> hello, hello. Like, we pay for this. This is not for free, okay? We already invest into buildings. We rent storage for our trailer, and we rent storage for other stuff that can't fit in my garage. We rent pavilion spaces during the summer and spring for gatherings. And then when it becomes impossible to walk outside without, someone, you know, without it feeling like someone smacked you in front of the face because it's like negative 20, we rent other facilities for special events like Christmas Eve services. Right? We, we already do this. We already, it's like, oh, spending money on brick and mortar. Like, we already do. We already invest in creating spaces for environments that will help us live on mission, serve one another, help strangers to become friends, friends to become family. But do you know what we don't have? We don't have a space for kids' ministry, we don't have a space for youth ministry. And after eight years of mobile church, we have proven it. 
that you cannot have a thriving kids' ministry and youth ministry without a place. But Phil, what about all the other churches that meet in schools? Don't they have thriving kids' ministries and youth ministries? Listen, I've done the research, and you're, feel free to do your own, but I'm confident that you'll find what I've learned. The mobile churches that thrive at having ministries to kids and ministries to youth have some kind of building to house those kinds of ministries. Mostly in part, it's a strategic thing. It's a, uh, parents, you know, being able to like, have some central place. But then even for youth, the idea of like a place. Even if they, you know, meet in non-permanent facilities like a school on Sundays, churches that are doing well at discipling young people have a place. There are a lot of things of building I get excited about, the idea of reaching people. Well, we got to be disciples who makes disciples. And I think that as we look at the next generation, and it's not just my kids. I'm, I can t- I'll tell you right now, I know there are families who no longer call Clarity home. And they love Clarity, but they love their kids. And they're like, Phil, I'm so sorry. We just got to go. I made a mistake when I thought that we could just have really great Sundays and allow people to outsource that stuff. So I have a heart and a very strong desire to make sure that our kids, that's as much as it on us, get the ability to meet Jesus and experience his gospel in very real ways. And you can judge me. I just think a building is a tool to help for that. Call me selfish. Don't get me wrong. Elementary schools have been an amazing context for gathering people to experience the reality of the gospel of Jesus on Sunday mornings. However, here is another thing. We can't stay here forever. Like, we can't stay at this school forever. And here are a couple of reasons. One, to the most people in our area... We don't exist six days a week. This church does not exist six days a week. I still have neighbors who, when they find out I'm a pastor, and say, yeah, Clarity Church, what's that? We meet at Edinburgh Elementary. Oh, where I send my kids? I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> like, people just don't know. I was talking to my friend, David Soren, Renovation Church, they've been in their community for over a decade. They throw huge block parties where thousands of people in the city of Blaine come. And until they build a building, people would still be like, what's Renovation Church? But now he, he, can, he cannot meet anybody in the city of Blaine who does not know who, what Renovation Church is now that they have their building. Like, oh yeah, the one right by the gas station. Oh yeah, yeah, it's new. There's just something weird about that. And if we're doing the work of missional investigation of how to reach our community, I think we just have to recognize that building, actually, place is important. Two, and I think this is something important in the light of our new realities, there are still others who would never consider trying church in a school. Because of the realities of COVID, strangers are even more unlikely to want to be introduced into a community of faith through a gathering at a stranger's home. I know a couple years ago, we we got really big into the idea of missional communities and people meeting in homes and inviting those far from Christ. We've tried that for probably about four or five years. We've learned some lessons about what it means to do it in the suburbs. It's different. All the models for missional house communities um, happen in in urban areas. But even COVID has changed the missional movement. I've been talking with my, many of the pastors that I've built relationships with as we've tried to pursue this. It has changed. People don't want to go into strangers' homes where they don't know the standards of cleanliness. Or whatever. Like it, just, it just, no, not going to do it. Now, I know some of you may be tempted to call those people shallow or consumeristic, afraid or whatever, but let me ask you a question Let me ask you a question. Does God desire that self-centered, consumeristic, fearful, uh, 
um, conspiracy-believing theorist people? Does God believe that these kind of people need to be conformed and transformed into the likeness of Jesus? Do those people need Jesus? I think the answer is yes. And these are just a few reasons why I believe it's time for us as a church to begin praying boldly for a more permanent launching pad for connecting with each other and connecting with people in our community. Some people call it a church building. Let me be clear, this is not about us being more comfortable. We don't have to set up. But it's not even that anymore. We've made it so simple. This is a vision issue. Over 36,000 people in Brooklyn Park are not connected to a community of faith, and they definitely are not finding themselves at a church gathering on an average Sunday. I believe that a building will allow us not only reach significantly more people for Christ in our area, but it will allow us to repurpose our time, repurpose our energy and resources more effectively in living. Oh, that's not. Whew. In living life as family together on mission with God. So think of the building not as something that you will just use to draw more people into our church, but as a way to increase the size of our launching pad to gather and then send people out as missionaries into the everyday rhythms of our lives. Don't you want to be a better missionary in the everyday rhythms of your life? And so our goal is to find a space to meet in as a church where we can amplify our reach and, out and impact. I'll just be honest with you, at this point, we don't know whether that means purchasing land or building on it or finding existing buildings and renovating or leasing, but what we do know is now is the time to pursue it. And if any of you have ever dealt with any type of commercial real estate or have any experience with that, you know that it's easier to go shopping with what? Money in your pocket, right? That's just a reality. And if we want to be able to purchase space or land or a building as it becomes available, we need to be financially able to secure that space. That's just a reality, okay? And the question is not whether or not Clarity needs a building now, because maybe we don't. The question is whether we believe Clarity needs a building in two to three years. Like, if I said five years from now, do you think Clarity should have a building? You're probably like, yeah. Ten years from now? Well, yeah, I mean, so the question isn't whether or not we need one now. The question is when we're no longer a young church, and then we're getting there. You realize in two years, we'll be hitting 10 years, a decade. Oh, my goodness. So that's what I'm asking us to pray for, to have bold prayers towards every single day, just for 21 days. Even if you don't believe in it, would you pray for the vision I think that God has put in my heart and as I've talked with some of you, your heart too. That's what it's going to take. 